Good evening. Good evening. Okay, we could do this better. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to the May 2nd, 2017 Brooklyn Borough Board meeting. As you know, I'm Ingrid P. Lewis Martin, Senior Advisor to Brooklyn Borough President Eric L. Adams. Currently, we do not have quorum, but we will begin the meeting without quorum. When we get quorum, then we will move to the, to the items on which we shall vote. Um, we're going to start with a presentation from Create NYC, New York's cultural plan process. So do we have presenters here? Please come forward, state your name, and all ears. Remember, whenever you want to speak, please speak into the mic, say your name slowly, loudly, so that Dawn can hear you, and also that it can be recorded on the television prompter. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having us. Thank you to the Borough President's Office for hosting us tonight at this meeting. My name is Nadia Alokta. I'm from the Department of Cultural Affairs. This is my colleague, Dylan House, um, who will give most of the presentation um, from Hester Street Collaborative, who are the lead consultants um, on this Create MIC project. I'll just give a little bit of an introduction, then he'll take us through um, the process so far and um, what we're hoping to partner on in our um, phase of public engagement coming up at the end of this month. Um, so the Department of Cultural Affairs um, has uh, been working on a cultural plan process um, since August of this year, um, based on legislation from city council and the mayor. Um, we, our agency was tasked with doing a city-wide cultural plan. So we're not only looking at the kinds of arts and cultural organizations that we fund as an agency, which is about 1,000 organizations, um, including um, 33 cultural institution group, uh, organizations which sit on city property, um, but looking at all of the organizations around the city, as well as artists, as well as um, groups of um, arts and cultural hubs that aren't necessarily funded by us, but are a huge part of New York City's arts and cultural um, uh, environment and the whole ecosystem. Um, and so part of what we're doing is uh, really robust public engagement around what it is that um, New York City residents see as the, the strength of, new, of arts and culture in the city and what it is that they're looking for um, so we can sort of strategically work together and try to um, uh, increase and improve access to and representation within arts and culture around the city. And this plan is a 10-year plan um, that will sort of lead us on that path as we work together with other city agents, um, partners, um, library systems, schools, etc. Um, around the borough. So we'd like to talk to you today about this process and how we can be involved with um, the constituents in all of your um, community districts. Thanks, Nadia. Uh, my name is Dylan House. I'm the design director at Hester Street Collaborative. Um, as Nadia mentioned, we're the lead uh, consultant uh, that's developing the plan with the Department of Cultural Affairs, and I'll talk a little bit more about our team in a second. Um, but just to give a little bit of context about why this plan is happening, Back in 2015, uh, Mayor de Blasio signed into legislation uh, the, the requirement to create a, a cultural plan for New York City um, that um, uh, a couple of uh, Council Member Van Bramer and Council Member Levin were the lead sponsors on. Um, <clears throat> this uh, mandates that this cultural plan be created every 10 years to help guide the city and how it um, uh, supports arts and, arts and cultural organizations throughout the five boroughs. Um, so as I said, um, I'm from Hester Street Collaborative. We're a nonprofit community-based planning and design firm, and we work um, citywide to engage New Yorkers in both the built um, and social infrastructures of the city. So uh, engaging people in, in participatory planning processes. And one of the members of our team that's helping to develop the cultural plan is Naturally Occurring Cultural Districts, New York, which is um, an umbrella group for place-based arts organizations across the city. So a couple of those members that are based in, in Brooklyn, like El Puente in Williamsburg in, and Bushwick, um, Arts East New York, um, and Groundswell, have all been really working hard um, to engage their own communities in their neighborhoods and the cultural communities that they serve. Um, so why are we looking at this plan right now? And it's really because New York City invests more in arts and culture than any other city in America. And the Department of Cultural Affairs itself is second only to the National Endowment for the Arts in terms of supporting arts and culture. And what that looks like is a thousand organizations across the city, um, many of which are in Brooklyn, which is the 
you know, second largest concentration of cultural organizations in the city after Manhattan. Um, and together between um, Department of Cultural Affairs and the Department of Education, we fund more for the arts than any other entity in the United States, in New York City. Um, we have a pretty broad definition of what culture is for this plan. It's, it's really what we think about when we think about our city. It's what, who we are and what makes our city great. So it's all of these different things. It's our history, it's science, it's the library systems, it's block parties in our communities, community events like that. Um, and the, the plan will address several issues that are mandated by the legislation, looking at um, from equity and inclusion and access, so how um, are people in, in communities across the five boroughs able to access arts and cultural resources, um, to things like citywide coordination, where it's not just recommendations that the Department of Cultural Affairs is instituting in their grant making, but it's also looking at um, all the agencies, both that have you know, arts and cultural programs, like how DOT has a public art program, or the Parks Department does, and integrating arts um, and cultural planning into those different agencies working together. But it's also you know, arts education, public art, um, affordability for artists and arts groups to, to remain in the communities that they're in, et cetera. Um, so this process began in earnest in August and has to be um, delivered to the city council on July 1st of this year as mandated by the legislation. And to develop the plan, we've really been trying to reach um, the arts and cultural community across the city as much as possible. So we've had um, many events, um, about 387 events in the five boroughs. Um, each borough had a very large uh, public workshop. We had the one in Brooklyn in December of last year at Brick. Um, Council member Cumbo kicked us off there. Um, and uh, we've also been working with a couple of other council members to bring engagement into particular communities. Uh, but like I said, we have this network of networks approach where we were working with arts organizations in very place-based ways to engage the communities there. Um, we've also been surveying um, uh, residents across the city. We've had almost 9,000 surveys conducted um, and many topic-based focus groups. So all of the public engagement that we um, have conducted and the research that we've been doing are feeding in to develop recommendations for the plan. Um, and it will include um, recommendations around uh, policy, um, projects, so capital projects, and program recommendations. And we're thinking in short, medium, and long term, so short being next year's budget cycle, not this year, but what might be able to be implemented in the next fiscal year, um, medium term being the next mayoral administration, and long term being 10 years, so that like decade lifespan of the plan. Um, and we're at a very critical moment where we really want to reach out as broadly as possible. Um, at the end, uh, or at the middle of May, we'll be releasing um, so, sort of a preview of the plan of what we've heard, um, so a preview of these recommendations for the public to weigh in um, and make sure that what is there reflects what um, the, the city and you know, communities across the city need around arts and culture. Um, so there'll be both an online platform um, where people can weigh in on their priorities and suggest things that might be missing, and there'll be public events across the city. Um, we'll be working with the library systems to have public events and with the borough arts councils. So in Brooklyn, we'll be having an event on May 31st at the central uh, branch of the Brooklyn Public Library uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, and we'll also be working with the Brooklyn Arts Council to host an event. Um, and we really wanted to talk to you today about how we can help get the word up, out about this online platform and drive people to these events um, you know, in, uh, between May 15th and May 31st. So um, did, do you want to add anything? or? Oh, we just want to open it up for any questions you might have about the planning process or ways that we could potentially work together to, to enrich it. Thank you. Do we have any questions? If you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Okay, so I'd like to thank Nadia and Dylan for the wonderful presentation and we'll move on to our next presenter which is Liquid. Air liquid? Okay. 
Air Liquide. Okay. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Roy Bant. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Air Liquide, and we're going to be building uh, 12 hydrogen charging stations in the Northeast. The hydrogen will be charging fuel cell vehicles, which are actually electric vehicles, and I'll get more into that as we move forward here. My colleague Tom is bringing up my presentation. Do you have the, uh, the remote? So while Tom is uh, doing that, my company is the world leader in industrial gases. We're the largest industrial gas company in the world. Uh, Air Liquide's operations in the United States go back to 1916. Uh, we acquired uh, a company called Airgas that everyone may have uh, heard of in uh, 2016. And, okay, thanks, Tom. Um, okay, so Air Liquide relies on more than actually, we have 67,000 employees now in 1,300 locations. We acquired another large company called Airgas, another industrial gas company. I apologize for the small print. Um, again, we're an industrial gas company and related services to customers in many different uh, sectors of the manufacturing and many other industries, chemicals, electronics, healthcare, metals, construction, food and beverage, oil and gas, automotive, research and analysis, and we have well over 1,800 patents as well. Several R&D centers in the United States and the globe as well. So we, you can call us a highly technical company. We're, we're a lot of engineers and scientists. I'm also a mechanical engineer, and if I get too deep uh, into the hydrogen here, please feel free to ask me questions. I tend to go over people's heads, and I have no problem answering any questions that you may have to further your understanding of what we're doing. Next slide, please, Tom. Okay, there you go. So basically, one of the uh, biggest technologies and products that we sell, uh, we take products out of the air and sell it back to you. So we have air separation plants, we take oxygen, nitrogen, and argon out of the air, and we sell it to many different industries for many different technologies, well beyond the scope of, of this meeting, but we sell those gases as well. We also sell many other gases, hydrogen, helium, carbon monoxide, CO2, many different mixes for many different uses in manufacturing and highly tech, high technology companies across the country and the world for that matter. Next slide, please. So uh, coming back to hydrogen, it is our intent uh, to create hydrogen and have 50% of our hydrogen for these vehicles is gonna come from renewable means by 2020. So the hydrogen we're gonna be using to fuel the vehicles, 50% of it by 2020 will be renewable and more and more renewable percentage as we move forward, as we find more waste gases or waste streams to produce the hydrogen from. We can make hydrogen from landfills, biodigesters, wastewater treatment plants. We process it into what we call renewable natural gas, RNG and from natural gas, we can make many other different products, including renewable hydrogen that we want to use for transportation. Next slide, Tom. So what is a fuel cell vehicle, folks? A fuel cell vehicle is an electric vehicle. It has an electric motor in it. The electricity does not come from a battery. The electricity comes from a fuel cell. Everybody's familiar with the Tesla vehicle. It's 100% electric, and the, and the battery inside a Tesla vehicle is 1,200 pounds. The fuel cell vehicles are powered by a fuel cell. A, does it, I'll explain what a fuel cell is. Did everyone see Apollo 13, Tom Hanks? 
Well, the rocket went into space with liquid hydrogen and liquid hydrogen in huge tanks on the shuttle. The hydrogen in space was actually utilized to go through a fuel cell to produce the electricity to power the So the fuel cells actually came from the aerospace program, much like many other things, like the microwave as well. So the fuel cells have been around for a long time, and Toyota has really somewhat, we'll call it, perfected it. And many other manufacturers have fuel cell vehicles as well. But the fuel cell vehicle actually has an electric motor way up front here. The fuel, can you go back to that slide, Tom? So there's an electric motor up front and the fuel cells in the back here. It actually takes gaseous hydrogen and it goes through some membranes and different stacks, depending on the voltage, and it actually produces electricity to feed into the electric motor. The electric motor actually looks like a combustion engine, but it's actually an electric motor, like an electric vehicle. There are two high-pressure tanks in the vehicle, and it actually has regenerative brakes, which means when you brake the vehicle, you're also producing electricity that does go into a small battery that we have in the vehicle as well. And to further that, many of the vehicles that are currently used around the world, and by the way, the U.S. is kind of behind. Many other countries have fuel cell vehicles. But the vehicles available in Japan, you can actually plug your house into the vehicle and power your house for about five days on a full fill. So I don't know if that option is going to be available from all the uh, OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, but it may be an option. Just an FYI, you can plug your house into your vehicle and power for five days. Next slide. So just a little more about uh, the fuel cell vehicle itself. We talked a little bit about the makeup. Um, but the most important thing is that you put hydrogen through a fuel cell and it mixes with air and it makes electric current. And the byproduct that results from that is water. So water comes out the tailpipe, and you could drink it, but I wouldn't. Next slide, please. So um, again, globally, many other countries, especially in Europe and Japan and Asia, have many fuel cell vehicles already out on the road. California started the process about nine years ago, and currently they have 27 hydrogen refueling stations currently in operation in California. Six are in the commissioning phase, six additional in the commissioning phase, three under construction, 10 in the approval or planning process. Um, additionally, 16 total stations, including one of Air Liquides, are being added through the California Energy Commission Alternative Renewable Fuel and Vehicle Technology. Um, but I'm also going to say that the state of California subsidized most of the stations in California, so they're all state funded. Um, my company, Air Liquide and Toyota, are in collaboration to bring our 12 stations to the Northeast, and my company is financing everything for all 12 stations. So we're about the future, we're about green technology and zero emission vehicles. That's what these are considered, zero emission vehicles. Next slide, please. So we currently have one station running in the United States in Anaheim, California. Here's an actual picture of it. So here's a fuel cell vehicle right back here, and I'll have some more pictures of different vehicles coming up. If you can see what we call the dispenser, it looks just like a regular fuel dispenser when you pull up to a gasoline station. Uh, and behind these walls back here is all the hydrogen equipment. All the equipment is modularized and we need approximately 2,000 square feet to 2,500 square feet of space. And, excuse me. And we could build them around the corner if we need to. So as you can imagine, we're building stations in New York City and are given very little real estate, so we're being very creative. So this station will fuel 40 cars per day and again, it's all modularized and everything can go around corners, but we have the capacity of each station to fill 40 cars a day. Each station will have one dispenser. 
Next slide, please, Tom. So, there is um, an eight-state MOU, a memo of understanding amongst eight governors, New York is of, of one as which of the states, to get 3.3 million ZEVs, Z-E-Vs, and that stands for zero emission vehicles on the road by 2025, and fuel cell vehicles are a ZEV along with electric vehicles as well, because the fuel cell vehicles are actually electric vehicles. Um, we want to reach 3,000 PEV charging stations to support an expected 30 to 40,000 PEVs on the road by 2018. In, 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 the, in this part of the, there are eight states, all of which are not in the Northeast. So in the Northeast, we need to bring 1.7 million zero emission vehicles into the Northeast. And this is part of that effort. So the New York City has an 80 by 50 program that's currently in place, which is going to reduce greenhouse gases by at least 80% by 2050. That is the intent. And that's the reason to bring fuel cell vehicles into New York City. Uh, with, with, to further that, with an interim target to reduce emissions by 40% by 2030. Uh, there's New York City Clean Fleet. We've actually had conversations about turning uh, taxi fleets into fuel cell vehicles as well. So that's, there's an initiative there. We want to cut municipal vehicle emissions in half by 2025, 80% by 2035. Next slide, please. So the, if anyone went to the New York City Auto Show, uh, I was there, there was, uh, the Mirai was there, which is Toyota's vehicle. It's M-I-R-A-I. -I. You can actually lease the vehicle for $349 a month, and you get three years of free fuel. So Toyota's pretty serious about bringing the vehicles in. The Honda Clarity, you can lease for $369 a month and get three years of free fuel as well. Both these vehicles were at the New York City Auto Show. Now the Hyundai Tucson, wasn't there, but they have a similar program, and Genesis is actually coming out with a vehicle. They're a part of Hyundai. They were at the show. So by 2018, 12 stations from New York City to Boston will be built. We have four stations in New York, Bronx, Brooklyn, Hempstead, and Farming, uh, Farmingville in Long Island. Uh, we have four in Boston two in New Jersey, one in Connecticut, and one in Rhode Island. The, um, the range on a full fill, everyone talks about the electric vehicles and what they call range anxiety, where if they get a charge, they can't go very far. We call that range anxiety. So the Toyota Mirai, or the, the Clarity has a range of 366 miles on a full fill. The Toyota Mirai is 321 miles. The Tucson is 312 miles. That's EPA rated mileage. Of course, your driving habits can change that considerably. And that does not change between city or highway. Uh, the other interesting thing is that all the stations will be available 100 miles apart. So you'd be able to go from North Jersey to Boston by second quarter of 2018 to fill your vehicles. And we're gonna be going to phase two and building more and more stations to allow more convenience to fill your vehicle. Now, if you have a, a vehicle and you lease it and you wanna take your family to somewhere in the Midwest where you're not gonna be able to get hydrogen, they'll bring you a gasoline car to take with you free of charge. That's how serious the, the companies are to bring these vehicles here. They want the customer experience to be as positive as possible and make it as convenient as possible for customers. Next question. How long has, uh, has this, have you had this in California? Uh, they started the process about nine years ago and they started building stations about Sorry, five I, years ago. I, uh, I gotta say my name, Barry. Uh, Spitzer from uh, Community Board 12. And, and your question is how long ago did they start they building in California? 
about six, seven years ago they started. And they only have how many? They have 27 stations in operation now, six about to be commissioned. In a state that has 40 million people. It's, it's gaining a lot of momentum, the hydrogen. Right. In addition to all the electric vehicles they have out there. So California is much further ahead with uh, ZEVs, zero emission vehicles. Teresa Scavo. Can, can we just let him finish with the presentation and then oh, we'll ask okay. questions? Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, that was my bad. I, okay. I wanted to be That's interrupted. Okay. But Don't be interrupted. Thank okay. you. <laughs> uh, benefits for Brooklyn. Um, Increase access to cleaner, energy-efficient alternative fuels. Remember, these are zero-emission vehicles. The exhaust is water. Provide fueling stations that are more resilient to combat future crisis events like Superstorm Standy. Remember, I talked about you can plug your house into your vehicle. As an option, folks, I mean, you can get that port on the vehicle. I don't know if it's included in the lease, but in the future, they will. So you can plug your house into your vehicle. And in fact, uh, there are buses and large trucks that are going to be fueled by fuel cell vehicles as well in the future, but our stations are for fueling light vehicles like the three I showed you earlier. Also address community health concerns around air pollution and the need to reduce emissions through the borough. I'm an asthma sufferer myself. I love the technology and I want to do everything I can to reduce pollution. Major cause of asthma is diesel fumes. If you live near a port, chances are you have asthma already. And pave the way for long-term sustainability in New York. Next slide, I think that's it. Um, yeah, just one last slide. Um, the hydrogen that's gonna be coming into the city is gonna be a high pressure gas. We're gonna be delivering to each station once or twice, maybe three times a week, depending on the need for the station. Again, 40 cars a day. Uh, we foresee about four, four or five cars a day per station to start. And as the OEM start, start selling vehicles, it'll be much higher. And we can make, I alluded to earlier, we can make our own hydrogen through an SMR, which is steam methane reformer from natural gas. And we could also make hydrogen from electrolyzers, which, which hydrogen is made from water by electricity, so we do have that technology as well. Next slide. And that's it. I'd like to open it up for questions. Yes, sir. Ed Powell from uh, Community Board 14. Thank you. Um, how long does it take to fuel a single vehicle from empty? That is a great question. I should have put it in my presentation. No more than four minutes to fill the vehicle. Because of the engineering of the station, we cool down the gas to about minus 40 degrees Celsius, and it's about 11,000 PSI filling. So it's very high pressure, very cold. Most of the time, to uh, totally empty tanks, both, I would say, no more than five minutes, normally no more than four. Very quick fill. Next question. Teresa Scavo, Community Board 15. First, what, how many stations are planned along the East Coast? Uh, in a lot of our uh, residents in my district, the snowbirds that drive to Florida. So would there be refilling stations along the way? Uh, there's, there's only right now 12, and my company is the only company building hydrogen stations in the Northeast right now. Initially, there's going to be 12 just in the northeast, and we're going to expand by going further south toward D.C., then later keep going further south. So this wouldn't be viable at this point for someone who wants to get to Florida? Well, viable, I mentioned earlier that if you want to go to Florida and you own a fuel cell vehicle, you call either Toyota or Honda and say, I need a gasoline vehicle to bring you one so you can take it down there with you. I don't know how long you could keep it there, but if you wanted to take your family down for a week or two, they'll give you a car free of charge. Next, I'm not big on the chemistry involved. Is there a possibility <clears throat> with the hydrogen when it's refilling of any sort of sparking, um, explosion, 
Hydrogen is safer than gasoline. I don't want you to take my word for it. I tell everyone, I want you to draw your own conclusions. Gasoline spills on the ground okay. and it stays there. Hydrogen, all it wants to do is come out of wherever it's coming from and go, wants to go up very rapidly. It wants to get up and go away. So these vehicles in these stages have many, many safety standards built into them where when a vehicle pulls up, it goes through several safety protocols before it would fill the car. So the car has to be deemed safe by those safety procedures before it would fill. Let's say the car had a leaking tank or something like that. It would not fill because the computer and the safety measures already set up will not allow it to fill. So but the possibility exists. Th there's a possibility it exists, sure. You know, uh, but we have many sta safety mechanisms set up. There's cameras in the dispenser. If anything ever happens, if it sees a spark or a fire, everything immediately gets shut down and drained if possible. If it deems that the danger is high enough, it will purge all the hydrogen. And, and by the way, there's the equivalent of about 180 gallons stored at each station with an equal amount of hydrogen. One kilogram of hydrogen is equal to one gallon of gasoline, and each vehicle holds up to six kilograms. So you're filling the vehicle up with six kilograms of hydrogen which is the same as six kilograms of gasoline. And if you noticed, with six kilograms, you can get 366 miles with the equivalent of about five or six kilograms. So it's a much more efficient process because it's an electric vehicle. It's not a combustion engine. It's much more efficient. But if I, uh, we're working very closely right now with the New York City Fire Department. They have many questions like you do with safety. And they've even given us some great ideas to think about that we have already implemented in our design. So as you can imagine, we have a great relationship with them and we're collaborating with them and implementing all their suggestions. Good evening, Shirley McRae, Community Board 2. I have two questions. The first one involves accidents. If this car gets hit, does it, you have to tell me about gas tanks. Does it explode? What happens? Okay, I know for a fact that Toyota has pushed these vehicles off a cliff and shot at them with 50 caliber rounds with no damage to the vehicle. So they've taken a lot of safety precautions. And those, the tanks are carbon fiber wrap tanks that have bullets bounce off them. Very strong. So, and, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. And if there were a situation that deemed that the car had to vent itself of all the hydrogen, mm -hmm. it would purge itself within a minute. So it would purge all the hydrogen from beneath the car and up and away in about one minute because it's high pressure and it's all pointed in a safe direction if it had to do that. So that happens automatically? Automatically. Okay. And if, if the car is on fire, could happen. It could be next to another car on fire. Mm -hmm. It would automatically purge the hydrogen out of the vehicle by measuring high pressure because heat creates pressure. Mm -hmm. It will automatically purge that hydrogen. And remember I mentioned earlier, all that hydrogen wants to do is go up and away. Okay, thank you. My second question is, you said that there are 12 of these stations, that's what I'm going to call them, along the East Coast. Um, how many of them are in New York or in Brooklyn? None yet. How many are proposed? One in Brooklyn, one in Bronx, one. Okay. and two in Long Island for now. Mm -hmm. Now, if one of the manufacturers sells too many vehicles... That was my next question. ...and we get more than 40 a day, mm -hmm. we will have a mobile unit, a mobile station, to go somewhere to fill those vehicles. Now, that would be like another station. We're going to need to go through the fire department, go through all the safety measures, but we're going to know that before we get to our capacity for each station. So we want to make sure that people aren't waiting in line getting hydrogen. So we will, we have two mobile stations ready for the Northeast to install somewhere where needed if too many cars are pulling in. 
Okay, thank you. And my last question is, because I don't know any other way to um, identify them other than saying gas pumps, because I'm used to a gas pump. Okay. Uh, how many of these filling pumps are at each uh, station? You, okay. you one understand at what each. I'm saying? There's exactly. one station, but in the station, like now you can pull up to a gas station, it can, it can have four, four or five pumps. It, will that be the same with this um, ZEV? Uh, no, ma'am. It'll be one dispenser per station. So we're making appointments now to get hydrogen? Well, remember, it takes four to five minutes to fill your car. Okay. And we can handle 40 a day. All right. And we can handle 40 back to back. If one car pulls in, the next car pulls in, back to back it will fill, but up to 40 a day. Mm -hmm. um, one dispenser per station. If there's going to be a future need where the customer experience isn't good, meaning people have to wait and wait and wait, we're going to build an additional station nearby, and we're building two mobile stations right now. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Barrington. Yeah. Sorry. Ms. Oh. Uh, hi, Jack from Councilmember Deutsch's office. Um, um, I, I like the idea of the monetary incentive with the fuel. I think that's a really great idea, um, especially for our New Yorkers who are you know, tight with the but with their budget, um, but I'm just curious. Currently, are is there are there any other monetary incentives that are being worked uh, through you guys that uh, would encourage New Yorkers and and people across the country to invest in these vehicles? Well, remember, they're environmentally friendly vehicles. You're putting water into the atmosphere by driving one. Uh, three years of free fuel, up to fifteen thousand um, dollars. That's three years of free fuel and fifteen thousand dollar caps on those, and three forty nine for the Toyota Mirai and three sixty nine for the Honda Clarity right now. And if you want, again, go on vacation to somewhere that doesn't have hydrogen supply, you'll have a free vehicle, and you can plug it into your house if you need to. Other incentives will be coming that I I can't really discuss because I'm a hydrogen supplier. I'm not a car supplier, but I know that. Toyota, Honda, Hyundai, and Genesis are very big on customer experience. They want this technology to be, become very popular, very safe, of course, and they want customers to buy these vehicles. So incentives are coming and newer incentives are added as we learn more about what customers really want. And we want customers to buy them, so we want to incentivize them. Right. I'm on the supply side, not the OEM side, and, uh, but we're pretty excited about it, but again, it'll be four or five cars to start per station, and at some point up to 40, and we'll build more and go further south toward Florida. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Richard Flatow, Community Board 3 in Brooklyn. Um, two questions, one, what would the cost be to refuel? I know you talked about the incentives, but Eventually, the incentives are going to go away. So what would the cost be to refuel? And the second question, could you tell us if you have any potential sites for Brooklyn? I know you said you're looking at one site for Brooklyn. Do you have a particular location at this point? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm going to turn to my colleague, Tom. Do you know which district is that? I can't give an exact address. I'm under a non-disclosure right now. Yeah, it's going to be in uh, Councilmember Menchaca's district in Sunset Park. Pertaining to your question about the mileage and the costs, um, it's going to be more than gasoline. Uh, to fill your tank all the way, in California, it's about $15 a kilogram. Um, you know, about $70 to fill your vehicle up with hydrogen. Give about 65 to $70 to fill your vehicle up. And you're going to have a range of over 300 miles, up to 366 if you're a very good, efficient driver. More expensive than gasoline, but it's very friendly to the environment. But you're going to have three years of free fuel. You'll get a fuel card, and it's part of your lease for three years. Do you have a um, uh, final question? Do you have a proposed opening date for that 
first station? Uh, sometime first quarter, 2018. Again, we're working with the fire department right now, waiting on their approval. We've been working with them for well over a year. Collaboration, education, emergency response training, everything the fire department requests to uh, deem these stations safe in their opinion. Hi, it's Barry from Community Board 12. Uh, quick question, do you at any point envision having a, a, uh, a hydrogen fueling pump at a regular gas station? Actually in Brooklyn, it's at an existing station. The one in the Bronx won't be in an existing station. Okay, so so why is why do you why are you envisioning so few at a time? Uh, the, they're very costly. It's about two and a half to three million dollars a station. Um, as they sell cars, we're going to build more. It really, we'll build more. We'll build more fuel stations as people buy cars. So we're going to see how things take off. We think it's going to be very positive. Um, and they're going to sell a lot of vehicles, and we're going to build more stations as they sell more vehicles. Oh, the reason I'm asking is because it's a little chicken before the egg. Uh, exactly. Or the, exactly. No, it's a great question. But as you can imagine, the investments my company's making, we don't want to build too many stations. I, I'm just thinking about myself. I wouldn't buy a car like this if, if I don't know that anywhere I go, I can pull into a gas station, like right now. It's it, range anxiety, we call it. Um, but we're placing our stations so you can go anywhere from New Jersey to Boston and be able to fill right now. Um, and we're going to expand and go south and going to build more and more stations as time moves on. And remember, California started out the same way and they have 27 stations and they're going to have 50 within five or six more years. Uh, and just my last question, I know we spoke about fuel cost. What's the cost of the actual vehicle? About $37,000 after tax rebates. And I think uh, New York just came out with a, uh, was it $5,000? A $2,500 rebate in New York City? $2,500, yeah. So there's rebates and incentives, both state and federal, to help reduce the cost of the car to provide more incentive to go that way. Okay, thank you. Hey, David Strada, Councilman Menchaca's office. Um, you mentioned you're working closely with the fire department on safety standards and getting installation, but can you speak to specifically to what regulatory agencies and statutes control the installation of a hydrogen fueling station? Great in, question. In New York State? Sure. We're working with the National Fire Protection Agency, NFPA2. Okay, that is a spec written around hydrogen. So all of our stations are designed to NFPA2. And of course, New York City fire code. So we're working with the fire department on NFPA2 and New York City fire code. Thank you. So as you can imagine, the fire department has a lot of interest and a lot of questions. So we, we, we meet with them often just to collaborate and talk about engineering and safety. Well, I'm, I'm just wondering as a relatively new uh, retail service delivery for this technology, does, does the fire code in New York City address in any way the specifics of your uh, physical setup and technical specs, or is it just uncharted territory? It's both, actually. Um, our stations are designed to be non-attendant. In other words, they're completely automated. We have cameras everywhere and safety mechanisms. Um, we're working with them for for all the safety and everything involved. Uh, they brought a lot of good ideas to us. Um, one thing I didn't mention earlier, we have a very similar station at the JFK airport as well. So we were delivering to that for many years, fueling uh, shuttles and buses and things like that at the New York City airport. So the fire department was very familiar with that. Uh, that, that station is uh, what we'll call mothballed right now. Uh, they're going to be bringing in many more vehicles in the near future, so they're kind of familiar with that. But um, it's uncharted territory, and the reason for that is it's, uh, they were unfamiliar with the hydrogen for fueling. Um, 
and we're working with them to make sure it's not uncharted territory and that it's safe territory. And, and working with them to make sure it's safe, and more importantly, they're comfortable, as well as the public is comfortable. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Bant. So we still do not have quorum, which isn't good. So I am not really sure. We'll try to wait a few more minutes to see if anyone comes. I think they said two more council members were coming. So we'll give it a few more minutes. In the meantime, Teresa, I see your mouth. You're like, oh my God. <laughs> Um, in the meantime, all of you should have received minutes, so if you want to peruse them, you can look at them in case you see any errors with them. And um, we also gave some handouts about um, our Central Brooklyn Arts and Culture Weekend, which will be June 10th, Saturday evening, movies under the stars behind the Brooklyn Museum. We hope that you will spread the word and have plenty of people come. We'll have face painting and um, music and fun activities for children and families. And the Sunday, June 11th, we'll have our annual Central Brooklyn Arts and Cultural Weekend Walk, where people have an opportunity to visit the library, the Brooklyn Museum, the Botanic Garden, Ron McNair Park. Um, there'll be trucks along Eastern Parkway South with food vendors and artisans who will sell wares. We'll have different dance productions and storytellers and animal exhibits. It's really a fun, fun, fun event for children. Over by the Arch, we'll have DJs playing music. We hope to have a dance party. So we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago where a number of community boards came to the meeting and they received packets and they're going to partner with us. So we hope that you will also um, participate. So you want to look at the minutes. Um, in the meantime, I'll also take attendance. Um, Keisha will call out the name of those who are here. And I guess if um, people don't come within the next two to three minutes, you know, we'll move to close the meeting and then I'll let the borough president know that we did not achieve quorum. So you want to call the names of those who are present? Community board two. I am here. Community board three. Here. Community board four. Community board five. Community Board 6, Community Board 7, Community Board 8, Here. Community Board 9, Community Board 10, Here. Community Board 11, Here. Community Board 12, Here. Community Board 13, Community Board 14, Here. Community Board 15, Here. Community Board 16, Community Board 17, Here. Community Board 18. Councilmember Barron, Councilmember Cornee, Councilmember Cumbo, yeah. Councilmember Deutsch, yeah. Councilmember Espinal, yeah. Councilmember Eugene, Councilmember Gentili, Councilmember Greenfield, yeah. Councilmember Lander, Councilmember Levin, Councilmember Mizell, Councilmember Mealy, Councilmember Menchaca, present, Councilmember Reynoso. Councilmember Traeger? Sure. Councilmember Williams? Here. Thank you. Okay, since we do not have quorum, um, I guess we'll adjourn the meeting. We don't have to move a motion or anything because we have no quorum. So I thank those of you who were here and who were on time. And I apologize for your colleagues for not doing their due diligence. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.